Hallo, welkom bij de Diversiteit Podcast van Giving Back. Vandaag ga ik in gesprek met Cecilia en Michela. Mijn naam is Tina de Keizer. Ik ben een interviewer, vrouwencoach en podcaster. En als host van mijn eigen podcastshow, The Women's Table, geef ik vrouwen een plek aan tafel. En praat ik met ze over onderwerpen die specifiek vrouwen raken. Ik wil graag bewustwording creëren over genderdiversiteit, inclusie en gelijkheid. Ik ben een trotse feminist en ik zet me in en maak me hard voor sisterhood en women empowerment. En feminisme betekent trouwens niet dat mannen worden uitgesloten. We hebben de man, mannen nodig, tenminste, dat is wat ik altijd zeg. En hoe mooi is het dat het thema van Internationale Vrouwendag 2022... De vrouw-man-solidariteit is de kracht van verandering. Um, vrouwen strijden al jaren voor zelfbeschikking, vrijheid, individuele rechten en gelijkwaardigheid. Maar met de emancipatie van de mannen gaat het niet goed. We hebben de mannen nodig, ook de mannen die zich inzetten voor feminisme en emancipatie in de brede zin van het woord. Dus met aanloop naar de Internationale Vrouwendag 2022 op 8 maart aanstaande, ga ik in gesprek met Michelle en Cecilia. En we gaan nu over in het Engels, want Nederlands is niet de moedertaal van Michelle. Cecilia, Michelle, welcome. So, would you like to tell us something about yourself? Just give us a short introduction. Who would like to start? Michelle? Okay, um, so I, my name is Michela and I'm coming from Macedonia. I have been living in Holland for seven or eight years. I'm studying artificial intelligence in Utrecht. This is my second year. And I met Cecilia by Giving Back. That's an organization that uh, helps actually people who come from other countries and who are going to university as first in their family. And we got matched in giving back. And since then, it is going really great. And um, I have the feeling like I have always someone there to help me and to help me with stuff that I don't really know about Holland. And I'm really thankful and I'm really happy I met her. No, oh, that's nice to hear. Cecilia. Oh, what, what kind of introduction <laughs> can I give after such beautiful words from our um, podcast moderator and of course from Michela Radojic. And uh, very, very grateful for this uh, introduction from both of you. Thank you very much. My name is Cecilia van Pesky and I'm a naval commander for the Dutch Royal Navy. But uh, I'm also a psychologist and I usually describe myself as a professional in peace and security because that's bas basically the leading themes for my um, professional career the last, well, I could almost say 30 years, but that already gives away my age as well. Um, and indeed, uh, Michela and I, we met each other through the Giving Back Foundation. And I would be uh, very keen and very eager to explain a little bit more what Giving Back Foundation does and in what way also we as a team, uh, Michela and I, have been trying to reach the, these aims and goals of the foundation. So what is your relationship like? Um, because what is it that makes your relationship special? Because we talked before and I noticed, Cecilia, you are very protective of Michela. Well, <coughs> perhaps I am a bit. and uh, But Michelle is also protective towards me. She gives me life lessons uh, about relationships and career choices. So so it's actually it actually goes both ways. Okay. But uh, I do have a bit of a tendency to, uh, well, kind of be there a little bit for the members of my flock. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle is not the only young person, young, uh, talented professional that I have the honor to um, guide on a, at least a a part of her way <clears throat> there is more there is a young a woman from uh, from afghanistan for example who i was able to facilitate the evacuation for last summer and um, there's uh, other people i've met along my way both men and women that uh, somehow stroll along for a while and it's a mutual um, reciprocal um, relationship because we learn from each other and i think that's also the part that uh, giving back foundation 
uh, offers us. It's an American foundation with also a entity in the Netherlands, which promotes the um, the development, the professional development of young people, specifically young people who haven't don't have the roots in the Netherlands, like who have a different national or ethnic background, and also are first in their families or amongst the first in their families to higher to um, enter higher education. Now this is the case in uh, Michela's story, <coughs> and I can't. Uh, tell you enough how fascinating this is to follow her in her development. So Michela, what have you accomplished since you started the program with Giving Back? Uh, since I started the program, I met a lot of people, so I have more connections. And also I have a great mentor who always is there to help me with stuff. We also have a personal connection because we talk also about personal stuff, mm -hmm. but also professional stuff. So if I don't know how some stuff work in Holland, then there's always someone that I can ask mm -hmm. and I can get help from. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. So if you talk to other people, why would you re recommend the program to other students from abroad? Um, the program is really helpful because like I said, you can make a lot of connections and it can really help you in the future. But it's also interesting because we do a lot of uh, workshops and it's really... Um, you're putting yourself in a position where you can meet a lot of people and you can make a lot of connections. And I think that making connections with people is one of the most important things because you can always use it in the future. Okay. So you study artificial intelligence, yes. right? Yeah. In Utrecht. Okay. So um, would you like to use your edu education when you, you finish in the interest of women? And is it possible to use your education, the study? In the I, would, of women. I would want to use it, yeah. but I haven't thought about it yet. So I'm not really sure how you can use it in that way. Yeah. But if there is any possibility that I can use it and help women, yeah. then I would definitely do you it. You definitely do it. Okay. So um, you do this program with giving back. And actually, this is a question for the, for the both of you. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to give back after finishing this program? Um, after finishing this program, I would want to help other people mostly people who come from other countries and don't have any experience in Holland. Mm -hmm. Because when I came here, I had a, it was really difficult for me to fit in because when I came, I didn't speak Dutch or English and now I can speak both of them. But in the beginning, there, there were no people that were coming from Macedonia, so I didn't have any friends. And I had to start studying in Dutch, so it was really difficult for me to fit in without any friends and without knowing the language. So if when I finish this program, I would want to do something to help other people who come from other countries mm -hmm. to make make it for them a little bit easier than it was for yeah. me. Yeah, wow, well, that's beautiful. <laughs> Cecilia, may I ask you the same question? What would you like to give back after finishing oh, this program? Your, your questions are very profound. Thank you for asking them. And um, I'm just listening with a lot of attention to what Michela is saying, because we've had, of course, we've had plenty of discussions together, but each time hearing it from her own voice, from her own words, it's interesting. Uh, you bring in, Tina, an extra element to our uh, our communications. And, and let me remind you in, in this sense, and I hope you permit me for doing so, Michela, it's really an extraordinary background Michela has. She was not a young child when she came to the Netherlands. She was already a teenager. And then entering a um, complex society like the Dutch society that has its own written and unwritten rules, it's really not easy. And in her case, she wasn't able, she didn't have to command over the English language. Well, you see how well she is in English nowadays. Uh, she speaks very well in uh, Dutch as well, but an interview is a bit easier in English. But when she ar arrived, she didn't speak Dutch, she didn't speak English. She went to um, one of these, what is in Dutch called an internationale schakelklas, that helps you like a kind of a condensed program of one year to have that induction in the Dutch educational system. And from there on, she already went to the Atheneum, so the highest level of um, high school in the Netherlands, and was able to enter artificial intelligence as a um, um, uh, you know higher education degree, which she's now uh, following the studies. And I mean, that is really remarkable. You don't see these success, 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 success stories always, but they are there. And what I'm hoping to um, contribute in that sense, <clears throat> what I'm trying to contribute for Michela 
And we have to remember, I'm not the only mentor she has through Giving Back. Giving Back is really a life, well, I would say almost like a lifelong program. Yeah. She ha- she received a mentor when she was in high school. And then I was the next one now in her bachelor phase. And there will be another one uh, in, in her master phase. And so what I'm trying to kind of offer Michela, I'm, tr- I'm hope she is. So she's the son and these um, mentors, they revolve around her as planets but she should be central it's about her it's not about these mentors and for myself i'm le- learning through michela a lot about uh, the generation that she belongs to and what are their stripes their challenges their ambitions and i'm receiving feedback on my on my personal behavior as well so we we very much see this as a kind of a transgenerational uh, connection Plus, I find it important to uh, stand strong as a role model myself, not so much towards Michela, but towards um, other women in my generation, other men in my generation, other professionals, that giving back is really what we need to do. We had all these advantages and we have to give it back to others. Yeah, you need the role models, right? Yeah, Yeah. and what's also difficult when you come from other country is actually the mindset from the people. Like every country has their own mi- has yeah. their own mindset yeah. and culture and way of living. Yeah. So then when you go when you're going to another country, it's really difficult to fit in in the culture and how people are living. Yeah. So that's also something that I yeah. think st- like people, young people who come from other countries need help with. Yeah, I can relate. I was born in Suriname and we moved to the Netherlands when I was 10. Yeah. So it's like um finding your own space in another country and trying to be yourself so uh, yeah i kind of get it that's interesting how we in that way kind of share our backgrounds not in the same depth it's it's different in that sense but i grew up in switzerland so i also was a bit older uh, when i entered dutch society albeit i was be uh, having um, dutch um, parents who were living and working in switzerland at that time but I was, as a child, I was teased with my accent. I, I, I always felt a bit different. And actually, to, to tell you the truth, to be frank there, at uh, 52 years of age now, I still feel I, I'm a, I'm, I fall, fall out a little bit of that mainstream Dutch uh, society. But uh, it also has its advantages, ladies. Don't you agree that it also gives advantages to, uh, yeah, to having that kind of bio or multinational background? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things we are going to talk about today, one of the topics is something I strongly believe that every woman at one point in her life has experienced. Sexual harassment, sexual intimidation and violence against women. And that um, from catcalling on the streets to unwanted attention, inappropriate sexual touches to sexual assault and even rape. So, um, in 2016, there was a report, Research, Violence Against Women by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. And I would like to start with some shocking results from the Netherlands. 45% of all women have experienced at some point in her life physical or sexual abuse. 73% has experienced sexual intimidation and one in 10 women has been a victim of rape. And the home is the most dangerous place for women. Would you like to respond, Michelle? Yeah, um, first of all, this topic is really sensitive to me. It's really personal, actually. And I know that it happens a lot on street catcalling and sexual harassment to a lot of young ladies and probably older women too. But uh, yeah, nowadays it really happens a lot and it's, it's really like, it's really bad actually. Like I cannot imagine that we're living in 21st century and this still happens. And women and girls don't even feel safe to go out in the night alone. And um, yeah, I feel like we guys should do something about that too. And I also feel like it, this all comes from how you raise the child, that's my personal opinion. Because when we're young, if um, there are two children and one of them is a guy and the other one is a girl, if the guy has a lot of girlfriends, he's really cool and 
even the parents are telling him like yes go like go find a girlfriend go f- do, go have a lot of girlfriends yeah but if the girl has a boyfriend then she's called like bad words like yeah so, the, shots, the slut shaming yeah starts. slut shaming yeah exactly so i think this issue comes firstly from uh, how parents are raising children because i think if uh, since young age you tell a, ch- a a guy that he's cool if he's having a lot of girlfriends or he's making comments about girls then he'll think like that in the future and he'll never change yeah. and then there's like i'm not saying that all the parents are raising their child wrong there are also guys that are actually nice and they don't want to do this kind of stuff but they have society pressure from their friends yeah. from the friends around them so then those guys are kind of pressured and forced to make these kind of comments and to insult women in a way because if they don't do it then they'll be called like oh yeah you're not cool you're not a guy you're you're a gay or like stuff like that and i find this really bad it's actually terrible and i think we should do something about that because it's really bad that a girl or a woman cannot even go out in the night without yeah. being yeah insulted or disturbed yeah yeah like it happens a lot it happens a lot that's right that's right yeah and it it even happens with with older women it it also happens to me (laughs) at my age (laughs) um i can imagine yeah yeah cecilia what uh, would you like to say about these numbers well, these numbers themselves are, of course, shocking. Yeah. yeah. And this um, research says it, what, there was a lot of attention devoted to these out, these study outcomes, and rightfully so because these numbers need to be ne- mentioned. Yeah. It shows the, uh, the 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 vastness, the the substance of um, <coughs> this challenging behavior we're seeing in our own society. Um, it is a topic that I'm focusing on as well, but I'm not uh, perceiving it in my everyday life in a similar way as Michela does. Michela is a modern woman living in a, in our bigger bigger cities, inner cities in the Netherlands. It's a different type of jungle, I would almost say, living in that a- a- environment. Plus, of course, uh, as a young professional, her uh, daily schedule is different, right? Like uh, clubbing, uh, going out, and it's, so you're you're experiencing different experiences. <clears throat> My a pers- not specific personally, but how I was confronted with sexual violence and um, aggression towards women was more in my work, working in, in conflict areas, uh, mainly in uh, countries on the African continent, but also in closer to our own um, nation, in the e- countries in Eastern Europe or Ukraine, for example, Georgia. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> But it worries me a lot that this is what the generation of uh, Michela is confronted with. And I want to make a very firm statement that this type of harassment should be brought to a halt. And I personally also see specifically that the key to change the behavior lays in the hands of both men and women. Yeah. It is, it, this is something we're, yeah. we're, we're, in, this, we're in this dance together. And, uh, and I emphasize a lot with the words that uh, Michela is mentioning as well, that I, in my personal belief, very often this type of behavior also comes from peer pressure within the male dominant group. <clears throat> and so in that sense, the aggression that us women sometimes uh, experience, which is focused on quite often sexual aggression, I think for men that, t- that same aggression is quite often targeted towards them for being part of the, um, the masculine dominant group because of f- falling out of that group. And it's in um, socio- social um, anthropological research, this is mentioned, they, they refer to this as the man box. As soon as you fall out of that man box, your access to resources is diminished, which is very hard for a man. If you ca- if you don't have access to uh, finances, to to work, to status in the household, uh, your your life is really bad. Per- perhaps in a similar way as it, for bettered women, sexually bettered women. So in so my, my statement here would be that we're both um, um, uh, suffering under aggression, only in different ways. And I think the the key to resolving uh, the issue to getting to a more like a more optimal situation, more prosperity for all. That key lays in in similar fashions, namely in education. Yeah. So um, I underline her words. I definitely do, Michela. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, what I think is that the, um, the responsibility for women uh, to be safe is, is, is put with women. Like, don't w walk on the streets yeah. that, that late. Um, why was she wearing that? Yes. Uh, why was she drinking so much? So is that, um, should we also put some responsibilities with a man? And if so, what do you think men can do to make it, this world a safer place for women? I, I, I totally agree with you. Like they always put the blame on the girls. Like you should not dress like that. You should not go out late, just like you said. But then there, we actually make a difference between guys and girls like that, between women and men, because the man is able to go out whenever he wants, to wear whatever he wants, to do whatever he wants. But then the woman doesn't have these rights. So then we're making difference between genders. And uh, I find this really disturbing actually. And I don't think we should put the blame on the women, but I should. I think the man should stop uh, harassing women because yeah. why would women dress up differently? Yeah. Why wouldn't they be able to go out because of the comments and the sexual harassment from a man? So I think that men should actually help the women go out of the situation and mostly older, like older, um, Parents, like I said before, I think the older the, the parents need to teach their kids that they should not that they should respect women actually, yeah. because once you're older, then the mindset that you have that you got from young age it just stays, mm -hmm. and then you get pressured by your friends too. So then it's really difficult to change your mindset. But if all parents teach their teach their kids from young age that they should respect women, mm -hmm. they should not make difference between gender, that everyone should be treated equal then it's different because then they wouldn't make, they wouldn't act like that anymore. Yeah, and this goes back uh, decades. You yeah. know, if I look at the way I was raised by my mom, um, don't don't go out late at night. Uh, when we were in high school, my sister and I, we were the only g girls who were picked up after a, a night out at, yeah. at the school. And all the other girls were allowed to to come by bike yeah. and we my sister and I were quite upset yeah, <laughs> because it, it, by then it's so lame you know but looking back yeah we are very grateful to our mom that yeah. she came to to pick us up and honestly I don't think it's also about what you wear or how late you go out because from personal experience even if you wear long clothes no makeup you're just like just wearing like normal clothes yeah. and going out in the day like so it's not a night you still get those comments yeah. on the street and yeah. you you get sexually harassed and what's uh sometimes i'm even like because it happens a lot to young women sometimes these women are also scared to answer normal questions on street yeah. Yeah. so let's say a guy comes to me and he wants to ask me where the central station is or something he, he just wants to ask a normal question Sometimes I don't dare to go and yeah. answer him because I think he'll he'll like attack me or something or he'll say something wrong. So that's that's also bad, I think, because women start being scared from men on the street. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I also think that men need uh, to be aware that women are actually quite scared. Yeah. Because when I talk to my husband, um, he's almost like um, two two meters tall. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, well, yeah. it's not that bad, right? No, it's not that bad for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. true. Maybe if men um, try to put themselves in the position of women, yeah. what it's like for them to walk home yeah. late at night, maybe then we can start from, from yeah. somewhere. Yeah, what do you think, Cecilia? Well, I'm having to contemplate a little bit of what is mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, your uh, thoughts are they're very precious to me. It's very interesting that uh, you're both so openly sharing about your experiences. And it makes me, of course, reflect also on my own uh, experiences. It's uh, definitely true. And isn't that the richness of this uh, women's table we're having today? That um, we do come from different generations and we do, do come from different um, national and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, I see myself really as the product of the 1970s, where uh, there was uh, very little um, gender inequality amongst young children. Um, we were all dressed similar in orange um, 
uh, dundies, you know, these du- duggeries, these like a one, kind of onesies you would call it nowadays. And um, also toys and, uh, and play for children were very equal. I was educated partly in the Waldorf education. In Dutch, it's called Freie School. And that also emphasizes that, of course, it gives you that opportunity. And, um, <clears throat> and then being a teenager in the 1980s, where the 1980s were rough, uh, there was a lot of uh, activity in the drug scene, but uh, I never really, although I was confronted with this in going when I was going clubbing, we, we, we called it going to the discotheque in those yeah. days. But um, like, um, like my father came to pick us up. Now you need to know my father was a reverend, so that meant that for him the highlight of the week was the Sunday morning where he had to perform in his sermons. Um, so when we would go out on Saturday night, it was uh, not so easy for him to come and pick us up. And he always said, I'm not coming to pick you up. You can do that yourself, your sister and you. You can just take the bike. But we said, Dad, come, please pick us up because we are too lazy to cycle home at now. Right. So that's why he kind of was forced to come and pick us up. So I personally, I don't want to send out a message to men that they have to consider women as being afraid of them. Because then we are putting a monkey on the shoulder of men that uh, women are some, you know, um, sensitive, fragile creatures that need to be protected. And personally, I don't think that is the way I want to approach this. I think women should be strong. Uh, They have the duty to be strong. They are strong. And together with men, we can be strong. Uh, but what I do feel is very important is that we start, stand, start to understand each other's positions in yeah. society better. Yeah. And I think for us women, there is an ob- obligation, a duty, a re- responsibility to help men understand uh, emotions better, like our own emotions, their emotions, by reflecting, by communication, by, for example, not, you know, if you're, if you're frustrated or angry, don't go sit sulking on the sofa because many men don't understand what's happening if you're sitting sulking on the sofa. You will have to explain them why you're silent. You know, why are you not feeling? You have to explicitly explain it. That's how you psychoeducate people. And vice versa, I think uh, men can, um, can sometimes do better in uh, understanding how these male-female dynamics are, are going. And uh, I mean, after all, all of us have masculine and feminine aspects to our uh, to our our being and to our personalities. So um, yeah, it's I think it's kind of finding resolution with the male and female parts inside of our own um, souls, if you want, what you call it as such, and find it in between the, the different sexes, and. Um, by just yeah by educating helping each other to learn yeah and that's not only responsibility for the parents of course that's a p- responsibility for the school it takes yeah, a village yeah. to raise a child Absolutely. it's for the whole society yeah. and for us as as individuals ourselves yeah. as well yeah so our next topic i would like to talk about women and leadership for example um you have female leaders male leaders uh, personally, I have an issue with the word female, with a combination of the two words female leaders, because I think you have leaders yeah. and um, I actually don't understand the difference that is being made with female leaders and, and, and male leaders. Um, you also have the pay gap. Um, women in the same position as men, they earn less, even if they work the same hours, it's exactly the same. So uh, what, what do you think of this, uh, Mi- Michela? Well, I actually wonder why is it like that? I want to know the reason behind it. Mm-hmm. Like if a woman and a man, they do exactly the same yeah. job. Yeah. And why does the woman get paid less than the man? I actually don't understand that fully and I would want to know the reasons for yeah, it. Yeah, well, I heard some comments like, well, women are not that ambitious women work part-time it's not about the same amount of hours Uh, women like to stay home with the kids some comments like that yeah like i think there might be some women that wants to stay home with their kids Mm -hmm. that work less and that's okay but we i'm talking about a woman that works exactly the same hours with a man and she gets paid less she does exactly the same job yeah 
So like a w- women don't not being ambitious or them wanting to stay home or not working the same hours like that says nothing about why women get less paid. Yeah. If they work the same yeah. amount of time. Yeah. I even heard that when a company has uh, two applicants for a job interview, uh, a male applicant and a female applicant and they're both in their 20s. Yeah. That the possibility that the male applicant gets hired is higher than the female applicant because uh, the company assumes that at one point in her life the women the woman will want to have children yeah that's disturbing actually because that's human nature like okay the women will get a child but that doesn't mean she she's supposed to get less chance to get work yeah because she might be even better than the man you never know yeah. like we cannot say that men are better than women and yeah. they're stronger or they have a yeah. better leadership because there are also women that are better than men too like you you cannot make difference between men and women in that yeah. way yeah yeah so cecilia what do you think because i i believe you're a female leader right uh, a, a woman in leadership <laughs> let's call a woman okay, in leadership okay you're a woman that's in the leadership wo- yeah that's our terminology yeah. i i i prefer to use yeah what is your experience um, within the male dominated world uh, oh, I love working in the male dominant. <laughs> oh, yes, it keeps me occupied <laughs> and uh, makes me curious every day how every f- everyone ticks and, uh, you know, why why certain uh, dynamics, how they are being played out at the work floor, but also in the environments I work at. So so I have a great preference in, in working in, let's say, a male dominant uh, work environment um, because I do feel that quite often um, men in my personal career mm-hmm. have helped have helped me to push on my um, professional development. Because uh, some men, let's not generalize, some men have the tendency to say, like, um, don't don't think about you know like falling or, um, or or you know having a failure when you take this decision or this step, <clears throat> because it's not in their mind either. So they just push you on like it's my female friends who say oh we will be there for you if you fail or you know like we will support you but i don't want that support i just want somebody <laughs> to tell me like do you, it right? you can like, do it you, well just go yeah. you know go without yeah. thinking yeah. and so that i you can really benefit from that male energy in your female friends and in your male friends and uh, male dominant uh, work environments just offer you that benefit <clears throat> i'm aware that there is a gender pay gap um I don't have all the research de- uh, data here, but I, my guess is that it's less in the Netherlands than in many other countries because we also rank on the UN uh, ranking list for uh, prosperous uh, societies. We rank very high, rank fifth, uh, you know, fifth from the top. And one of these elements is also equal pay. Um, what I do um, know from research is that it's quite often mentioned that um, a woman's job, and let's say specifically in earlier years, right? Like I'm going back to the 1950s, 1960s in the Netherlands, that a woman's job is not the um, the family caretaker's job. So she's not the one who has to bring in the family income. Yeah. And therefore, um, when a company had an X amount of money to divide amongst its workers, it went first to the male yeah. worker because he was the one that had, that had to provide uh, for the family. Which brings me back to the... Uh, man box if you're not fitting in that man box and you fall behind it you really have a big problem because it means that you can't feed your family and even earlier than that you can't even start a family which is what we're seeing also in many arab countries right like there's no access to work no access to resources you have a generation bulge of many men who are unemployed and don't have that buffer like that's that psychological buffer from having a family that's you know like and en- en- envelopes them like the wife and the children so uh, i see that and uh, so in that sense that gender pay gap how i have perceived it is i've never had that i um applied for a post not in none of my international posts and also not the like i've worked more international than in the netherlands but also in the netherlands i've never been sitting at my job interview where they said oh you're a woman so you're going to have less than that has always been equal but i have experienced that um <clears throat> people have perceived me as a professional um in the sense that it's kind of like a a hobby I'm doing that my work is a hobby 
and that that somewhere I have a husband who makes more than I do, so I'm not doing my job for an income. I'm just doing it because I find it, uh, you know, an interesting occupation. And I do find my job an interesting occupation because I do it with wholeheartedly. All my my different posts, I have given my best. But of course, uh, you know, like it, it, even you know, irrespective of having a partner, yes or no, I believe that women should ha- be economically independent. So um, there, I did have some, um, you know, like some second thoughts, like so, what is this perception? Um, <clears throat> but of course, in general, the topic of women in leadership, I think this is a very interesting topic, and I'm very happy. Uh, Tina, that you're bringing this to our women's table today. Yeah. Well, I can tell you about the pay gap. The pay gap, uh, there was a research done by Women Inc., of course, a very well-known uh, female organization in the Netherlands. And the pay gap in the Netherlands is 14%. And within a career, from, from the start of a career till the, pen, till the retirement date, um, women earn 300,000 euros less than men. If it's about the same position, the same amount of hours as well. So that's the pay gap in, in the Netherlands. I think that's a lot of money. Yeah, that is a lot of money. Yeah. Just like Cecilia said, there is a good reason why this um, this gap started existing. Because mm-hmm. like before, men yeah. was the one who was supposed to bring money to the house and yeah. care for the family. Yeah. That's, that's a good reason why it started existing. Yeah. But I think that we should change it because nowadays women go to work too and they need to be independent Mm -hmm. so i think we need to change this and it should not be like that anymore yeah 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 here here yeah (laughs) i'm not sure if you saw the documentary waarom werken vrouwen niet and in the documentary it was told that 3.4 million women in the netherlands are not financially um independent Mm -hmm. that's a lot of women yes yeah. So how can we, how what can we do to to change that, Michela? What do you think? How can we make women aware of the fact that they they need to be independent? Because if you look at other European countries like Belgium and France and um, yeah, women are aware of the the financial consequences of their choices. Yeah, I I think we should make them aware that they need to be independent because you never know what happened. Now you have a family, you have a husband, but yeah. like the next day everything can be gone. Something yeah. can happen and yeah. then you're alone. You you depend on someone. Yeah. That's really bad. Yeah. And yeah, I think we should give them awareness about that. But yeah, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, it has consequences on all uh, all levels because if you work part time you build a less pension, you build yeah. less uh, uh, for your retirement date. So if you work 20 or 30 years uh, part-time and you get divorced when you're in your 50s or in your 60s, um, as I, uh, a poverty amongst uh, women of uh, in their 50s yeah. is the highest in the Netherlands because women don't, and I'm, I don't mean to, to generalize as well, but women don't seem to, to think about, they don't want to think about it. Yeah. I'm happily married now. This will be, be the way. This will um, this will how it will be. Yeah. And when they are uh, divorced, then they um, yeah they, they 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 come to to poverty, and it's yeah. a huge problem within the Netherlands. Yeah. So, as a future female leader, what would be your advice to young women, women your age? What would be your advice regarding uh, what we talk about now? Like um, women are financially, women are too much depending on yeah. the, the income of their husband, like Cecilia just mentioned. Yeah. What would you like to say to women of your generation? Yeah, so I think that uh, young girls and women I think that um, once they start being in a relationship, they start depending too much on the guy. Mm -hmm. So it starts from the beginning. So they're not even married, but it starts from the beginning. They start depending on the guy a lot. So then they just want to marry the guy and then they just leave everything else. Like I think that women should first put their career Mm -hmm. and focus on their self and then later on marry and have a family 
or even if you marry someone, you should in a young on a young in a young age, even if you marry someone, you should still focus on yourself first. First, you should be independent, and then go with someone else. Yeah, yeah. So how how can we achieve that? Because we t- we uh, we talk about that they have to we have to change this. Yeah. But how how can we make young women aware? Because I also heard that women coming from college, coming from university, uh, uh, at the uh, Um, in their early 20s, yeah. they start working part-time, regardless of having children. So what what can we, how can we change their perspective? Yeah, we should make them aware of it, maybe using social media or just also it needs to come, again, it needs to come from the parents too, yeah. because the parents has already, they have already went through it and they have some experience. So I find it really important that the parents yeah. and the mothers in this situation actually tell their daughters that they should first focus on themselves, they should do something for themselves, be independent, and then go with someone else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny because this is something I mention in almost every podcast of mine. Um, my my mom, uh, just a personal story. Yeah. I'll make it short. <laughs> my mom uh, was 16 years old. And um, she was really, really beautiful. Yeah. And uh, my grandmother told her she, she wanted to, to study. She wanted to have yeah. an education. And my grandmother told her, you don't have to study. You don't need to have an education. Look at you. You're so pu- pretty. You're so yeah. beautiful. You will find a good husband. And my mom was like, mm, don't think so. So, <laughs> so she got an education. And that is something that um, she almost... Uh, slept uh, uh, around yeah. uh, with 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 my sister me finish school go to college get an education yeah. get a job make sure you are never financially depending exactly. on, on on a man not even a yeah. husband but uh, yeah. that you're not depending on a man so i i think it's very important yeah i think that, the support yeah. from the parents especially from the mother is really important yeah. because when you're a child when you're a teenager you're not thinking straight in that moment. Yeah. You're not, you don't have any experience. You don't know how life works. Yeah. So then I think the support of the mom is really important yeah. in this kind of stuff. She yeah. needs to tell you yeah. that you need to have education. You need to focus on yourself. And yeah. then later on, yeah. don't depend on anyone else, yeah. men or women. Yeah, I agree. Cecilia, what was it like for you when you were a kid? Was your mom uh, an example for you? I'm still processing and I'm thinking, <laughs> Tina, in your case, the apple didn't fall very far from the tree. Like your both your your mom and you, you were feminists, you know, yeah, like pure, yeah, pure absolutely. feminists. So thank you very much for sharing that um, anecdotal information. Very strong example yeah. from your own family. And um, but uh, yes, yeah, very interesting to think about these topics. And um, definitely the case is that uh, in the, if you look at the lifespan, like at, the, at least the professional lifespan for women, women um, tend to earn uh, much less. There are, of course, some reasons fi- for this. I mean, a lot of research has been <coughs> devoted to that topic. And what is quite often mentioned is that uh, since the Netherlands were um, neutral in the First World War, so it's really like a more than 100 years ago already, our women didn't have to um, work outside of the homes yeah. because the men were not at the front, you know, like at the military front, the campaign. And uh, that, that therefore we lag behind if you compare to countries like, like I spoke the other day to my Spanish friend who was having a baby. She, she worked for the Bank of Spain, a high educated woman. And uh, I said, so when is this baby do, of yours due, right? Like you're you're, you're going to have it one of these days. And like, when is your pregnancy leave starting? She, because I called her and she was at work and she said, no, well, it was, I was due last week, but the baby isn't there yet. So I'm working. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's a very different uh, yeah. type of thinking than what we're doing in the Netherlands. I'm not saying it's bad to have pregnancy leave because it's also for the health of the mother and the child. I lived in Norway for some years and... I tend to visit um, Finland quite frequently, and there they have long, um, uh, you know, a long time time period for pregnancy leave before and after the uh, birth of the child. <clears throat> But I do think it's very important to try to um, emphasize more equality there as well. Yeah. Why would it be the woman who takes all this leave? Yeah, yeah, I wanted um, to say that too. Yeah, yeah, but 
please add yeah. to uh, uh, what, yeah no go yeah, ahead I, um, uh, I find it weird that uh, the women needs to take care of the kid the whole time I understand when it's baby when it's just born then the mother needs to be there but after a while after one two months then I don't understand why all the pressure is put on the women like they need to be there for the kid they need to take care of the kid and yeah that's why man has more um, uh, possibilities actually because he has more free time he can work but then all the pressure is put on the women and they don't have any possibilities after that they cannot work they should stay with the kid so I find this um, I, I don't know why is it like that and I find it bad actually yeah yeah I, I, I believe in the Netherlands it is um, there's a strong opinion about what a good mother is mm -hmm. and apparently a good mother is a woman who stay, stays home with but, her kids but what's a good father then yeah yeah a good father is someone who works uh, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, and provides for a good financial and stable life yeah, for for yeah. for his family. Yeah. And and then you get to the double bind, because when a woman does the same, when she's having a career, and she works 70 or 80 hours yeah. a week, she's a bad she's a bad mom because yeah. she's never home. She's a bad wife. So th there is this double bind for, yeah. for women and men. Yeah, I have to say I'm quite hopeful there, though. I um, I recognize what you're mentioning, yeah. Tina, and it's very much so. I've noticed it in my own um, uh, working life. But um, I'm very hopeful because I do see that the younger generation, which also Michelle um, makes part of, yeah. they really look at this differently. Yeah. And the men take, young men, young fathers tend to take a much more active role in the lives of their children. And young women uh, are much more prone to, um, a, you know, um, achieve higher levels in their working careers. So I would say it's it's a bit both. Like um, I do feel education yeah. is important. Yeah. Uh, like edu but I sense I mean like um, edu like public education and making it clear for people what consequences of their behavior yeah. are. So women. Um, I think too long have been thinking, but I'm missing income when I'm not working like, or when I'm working part time. But they didn't realize it also meant not building up pension, for example. <clears throat> so there could be some uh, yeah, more thorough uh, governmental campaigning and uh, study results like uh, from the research done by Women Inc. to educate people like what really are the consequences. Of course, um, you know, child rearing practices, they have to go hand in hand if you want to liberate women so they can um, enter the, the world of work. It has to go hand in hand with um, lower prices for uh, daycare yes, centers, child, child daycare. Um, but then that should be really something that both men and women are responsible for. Yeah. I think the model that many people mentioned uh, where both partners can work four days a week instead yeah. of yeah. five. Yeah. Um, I think our society is moving towards this. And also uh, there's very beneficial beneficial results from the, the pandemic that we're just um, yeah. kind of emerging from, that uh, we've learned what it's like to work from home, yeah. which also gives parents um, sometimes a harder job, but <laughs> you know, having to take care of the kids at home, but quite often also more flexibility yeah. in a work-life balance. Yeah. I'm personally also a big proponent of the universal basic income, which gives people the opportunity mm -hmm. yeah. to not work for a while and then resume um, working life. Um, I do, at the other hand, also combined with all these aspects that I mentioned, I think there's also um, um, an obligation um, for both men and women to um, contribute to society. So I've never been uh, very much... Um, encouraging the idea that people should have the choice if they want to stay at home with their children, yes or no. I think it's a personal choice if you want children. Mm -hmm. It's a universal right, yeah. that's so, but not everybody needs to have children. So if you want them, it's your personal choice. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to uh, live with the consequences of that. And, um, and um, yeah, so I think uh, all these things together... It, uh, it is important to find a, be a better balance than what we're having nowadays. And sometimes I would say, uh, we, we mention quite often the uh, the glass ceiling, but there's also the sticky floor, right? That it's uh, very comfortable for being at, to be at home for women, yeah. not being judged uh, at their workplace, not having to reach targets. But uh, so, yeah, the floor is sometimes sticky. It's easy to stay at home. Yeah, but I also think that this brings us also to the man box. Because like we said, um, women mostly stay with the kids 
and men are the one who need to work and need to take get care the of the money. kids. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are quite a few men like in this world that would want to spend time with their kid and that would actually want to be on the place of the mom. Yeah. But I think there's this pressure from the society that men should not take care of the kids. Men should go work and they yeah. should bring the money. So that's also bad. That brings us to the first topic that we had yeah. earlier before. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Cecilia, when you say you're you're quite positive because you see that with this generation, you see things are starting to change with reference to uh, what Mich Michela says actually all the time that we need to start with education. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and raising kids. So you think that, do you think that there is a change going on already? Um, there uh, definitely there is, yeah. um, I would not, I'm not an expert in uh, like early childhood at the moment because I don't really, at my age, you don't have so many friends with little children anymore. <laughs> so I don't know really how that goes. Um, but, um, I do have, I do worry a bit if I look at social media that I sometimes think this um, perception of gender inequality and how we um, like how we approach young young people like younger children um, that we're having bigger um, differences than, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we had in the 1970s or 1980s. And I think that has come a lot with social media, that there is a certain picture that's drawn by these influences mm -hmm. that's very either very masculine for men or very feminine for women. Mm -hmm. And then therefore these role models... Um, also are imprinting in a sense like that that's that's how behavior should be so I see I feel that nowadays I see more with young children that they either behave very feminine or behave very masculine in their you know in tattoos and clothing and things like that uh, where for example like I mentioned earlier that being brought up in Switzerland partly and then also having lived in Scandinavia uh, there is much more, I would say, unisex in those societies. Yeah. Like uh, w w men and women wear the same type of clothes. They do the same outdoor activities in yeah. sports. Yeah. And in the Netherlands, I think that's more segregated. And that makes me worry sometimes. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Michela? Yeah, I do think that social media nowadays try to change this, though. Like... Um, they try to make uh, less difference between men and women and what they wear and stuff like that. So I think social media can help in this too, mm -hmm. like the raising from the ch uh, from the children, but also social media and also the people who have a lot of influence on our society, like famous people, singers, actresses, politicians, like all these people have a lot of influence on how the society thinks and how yeah. the society works. So yeah. I think it needs to start from the parents and from the more let's say important people, yeah. the famous people. Yeah, because I, when it comes to influencers, I I wonder if they realize what their influence yeah. is. I don't think they, all because of them realize that. Because if you sometimes look at, uh, let me start with Instagram, yeah. and you see these uh, women, I'm not judging here, just making an observation. Yeah. Um, and they are also beautiful and they are also fit and they are also successful yeah. and they raise their children and they have this uh, uh, million dollar company and four, four kids and no nanny and they do everything by themselves. I think um, that it's almost impossible to, to live up to these standards yeah. when you are just an, an ordinary person. Yeah, but I think it's really important that people actually realize that social media is not real. Yeah. Like everything what you see on social media, it's not the reality. How people look, you can edit all your pictures, yeah. you can look so different, you can act like your life is perfect, but yeah. actually in reality, it's not like that. Yeah. So people should actually realize that social media is, is it's not real and especially young men and women on in the teenage age in the teen, yeah, teenage age because if these people think that that's the reality it actually yeah. it can influence them in in a mental way like mentally yeah. it can have a lot of influence on them and that's really bad and i sh i think that the influencers should actually be aware of that yeah. and they should think before they 
post self and before they act in a certain way because it has a lot of influence on the society. Yeah, yeah. So let's use that uh, very strong instrument, social media. Yeah. Let's use it for the better, right? And yeah. Not for yeah. The worse. Because we do know that influencers, they have a lot of power in, in, in the way how they can influence yeah. large groups of people. So yeah. if, we have the, if, the, if we have the right influences there, then yeah. we also have yeah. a beautiful chance for a um, more yeah. positive uh, effect. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And uh, Cecilia, you mentioned earlier uh, gender inequality between women and men. Is there gender inequality? Um, <coughs> there's gender difference. If that's what you're referring to, yeah. there's gender difference uh, that comes from biological aspects. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an educational psychologist, educational and cultural psychologist. So I was trained in all these these differences. Many of them start even before we were born there, born there in our DNA and they are mm -hmm. influenced by like uh, the hormones we're exposed to in the womb already. And I, I like to think that our um, like physical, like when it comes to like body, our physical differences are not so large. They are less big than we, we sometimes think. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in our thinking, so our physiological, the way our brain is, is, is working, the cognitive parts of our, our being, uh, there are profound differences there. And um, I, f I guess maybe this is also what brings me to the um, issue that what I, uh, if we're talking about uh, equal uh, opportunities, for example, mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. where we're striving yeah. towards. If we're talking about equal opportunities in in uh, human resource, like finding the best person for the job, it's quite often mentioned. Like it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, as long as they are it, uh, that person, like our selected candidate, yeah. is is fit for the job, is capable for the job. But for me, that is not uh, the way how we should approach this because it's really like comparing apples and pears because you're not choosing between like a better and a less good candidate. I mean, that would be easy if you know which one is the best. Yeah. You're choosing between two people who are, in, if, it, if it is between two candidates, who are bringing in something totally different or quite often are bringing in something totally different. And by creating opportunities for both these entities or all types of diversity, right? We're talking men, women, we're talking about ethnic diversity, we're talking about gender, because it's not only just men, women, we're talking about uh, age differences, all this, ex differences in experience. By including this in the work space, then we have much more opportunity yeah. for having that diversity and yeah. therefore strength, th strength through diversity. And uh, so I'd like to think that it's important to... Um, have an open mind and also place people on positions that may, maybe at the beginning you wouldn't even think it would work out that well. Um, which, if I may enter that to the discussion, I find it an interesting concept. <coughs> it's been um, mentioned in the media lately as well, the cloning effect, that we tend to, like, uh, um, th those selecting people for a position tend to choose the people that yeah. are like yeah. like them. Yeah. Yeah. And we know this this happens. It, I do it as well when I'm yeah. uh, a selector. I try not to, of course, and I'm at least I'm aware that I'm, you know, I have a bias there. But you're looking for people that you recognize something in because you yeah. recognize it in yourself. And um, <clears throat> it's very hard to uh, select a person for a post that is very different from you because then you also like you don't have fami familiarity. You don't know what to expect, but the job has to be done. Yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe that's how we can use artificial intelligence in the future. So there is no bias, but the program can just like the computer can just choose by himself the candidate. Yeah. Such an know, excellent <laughs> idea. Such an excellent. So what would that work like, Michela? Because it, this is know. your your field. Yeah, I'm so not really like I, I'm not really so far in my study, so I cannot really explain it right now. But I know that it's possible. At least maybe not now, but in the future, it will be possible to do it without mistakes. Yeah. Do you think, think that's somewhere where we can work together? Because our, <laughs> yeah, because our giving back connection is not just for now, right? It's lifelong. We've yeah. said, I've always said it's till you don't want it anymore, yeah. but I will be there. But I, we've discussed this earlier. I mean, we can be frank about that. But the that's where artificial intelligence yeah. and psychology really touch each other, right? Yeah. Like the psychology of being and also how can we work 
from the AI environment yeah. in taking out biases mm-hmm. that perhaps our our physiology, our human physiology is not able to do yet, yet yeah. right? Yeah. So do you also think that artificial intelligence um, can be used for like blind auditions? Because in the 90s, in, I, I think it was the, the orchestra of New York uh, was for 90% uh, for, um, existed from wi- white males. And then they started um, blind auditions yeah. to get more diversity, to get more women in the orchestra, to, to get more uh, people of color in the orchestra. So um, do you think artificial intelligence can be used uh, one way or the other for a blind application? I think right now it's it's you still can we still cannot use it because Mm -hmm. it's not perfect enough and there there are always mistakes yeah but maybe in the future it will be possible but uh, but i'm not sure i'm not that friend yeah okay okay well blind auditions perhaps uh, i know that uh, and your example is very strong about the orchestra uh, but i know that in uh, the scarcity of uh, manpower we're having at the at the dutch labor market at the moment right there's not enough workers there's more open uh, vacancies than there are workers that some organizations are experimenting with just hiring anybody who um, applies so not this is like uh, cv free um, uh, applications okay so people who for example also have a um, history with detention, for example, and would have a very difficult yeah. um, path to, you know, yeah. back to yeah. work, yeah. or who have a history in um, drug abuse, yeah. mm-hmm. drug dependency, or who haven't been on the like a woman in her fifties who thirty years ago decided yeah. to stay home with the kids, now regrets doing this yeah. w- after her hus- husband left her, yeah. and then you know has a. It's very difficult for her to uh, have this um, reuptake in the domestic labor market. They would stand much more chances, and then you're, they're kind of given the benefit yeah. of the doubt, yeah. right? Like if yeah. they don't perform in the job, well, then you know maybe yeah. after some trial period. Uh, you can let them go again, but yeah, give people chances. Yeah, and uh, I would say this is also really the, the um, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you if you think highly of people, if you if you believe in them, if you show them that yeah. you believe in them, they will perform yeah. much yeah. better. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's yeah. really true. Yeah, yeah, that's also giving back. Yeah, yeah. So Cecilia, um, you also worked in other countries. Can you tell us something about the position of women, women in leadership in those countries you worked and which countries did you work actually? Oh, thank you very much for that interest, uh, Tina, because definitely, I mean, we've discussed today a lot about the situation in the Netherlands because mm-hmm. that's where we are functioning yeah. as being Dutch nationals. But definitely, um, this situation is not the same in other nations. The past 20, 30 years almost now, I've been um, working in um, different regions in the world, mainly conflict-prone regions, Eastern Europe, but also on the African continent and in um, Central Asia. And definitely, you can say that uh, in every country, the situation is different. In every country, though, I do find uh, also very strong women. Women really are up to the change and are also really bringing the change. They're real trailblazers. Now, I'm a member of the United Nations Senior Women Talent Pipeline, Mm -hmm. which is a specific pipeline, like a talent pool uh, of women on the um, uh, uh, higher management ranks that are... um, um, let's say, like, uh, they're, I would almost say, groomed, like, supported by the UN um, for positions of leadership in the United Nations. That shows that the UN really plays, uh, pays a lot of attention to this. And there I find these women of all these different nations. And I also see that many of them have had a much harder strive to get where they are than I did. Uh, with all the benefits I had from being uh, being brought up in the in the environment where I came from, I do have a great respect for those women who are always trying to make the difference. I've seen beautiful examples of this, very strong examples of this. Military women, for example, in uh, Eastern Ukraine, when I was working there for the OSCE, that uh, and as an example, a lady who was working as a secretary at the fire uh, station, the fire demar- department. Uh, you know, where they have the, the red trucks, etc. And she was an, a secretary, just an administrative lady. But when um, the conflict arose in um, eastern Ukraine, she felt she wanted to defend her 
her environment, her family as well. And she grew up within two years to be a commander of a battalion. Wow. And uh, yeah. yeah, after that, she she requested to have access to the military academy, yeah. which she didn't have before. Yeah. So these are amazing examples and very inspiring. We do so see, at the other hand, right, specifically at the moment, yeah, we are living in the COVID days, and uh, our world is challenged with economical crisis, with health crisis, with specifically with environmental crisis. And you see that it's often women who are first uh, um, feeling the effects of this. They are the ones who have to take, yeah. take care of the households quite often and also have to make sure that there's food on the table. Not always financial, but also just by producing the crop on the fields or going to the local markets. And if there's then there no food uh, available, uh, look at an example in Afghanistan. I was one of the last ones to leave Afghanistan last year after being deployed there uh, through the Dutch army in a NATO mission. It's of course, it's breaking your heart, absolutely breaking your heart to see the humanitarian disaster that's at play there and the, uh, the strife of the Afghan women as well to try to keep their heads for themselves and of their families above to survive. Yeah. It's pure struggle of survival. Now, these are very extreme examples. Afghanistan rates lowest yeah. on that UN rank of you know, co you know, prosperity when it comes to countries to live at. Uh, we, gr we rank number five, but even in our own regions, and um, you are both from, from, you have roots in different countries, in Suriname and in North Macedonia. I, I frequent North Macedonia. I know the situation there somewhat as well, but I'm sure that Michela will agree with me uh, that, uh, that, that already very close to, to the Netherlands, there is a different situation. Mm. Not always to the worst. I see very strong women in the Balkans, like really, uh, like, uh, <laughs> like really impressive women. Yeah. And, uh, but their situation is different. And uh, quite often they are also confronted with specifically domestic violence. Mm. So there's still a lot of work there to do. And I hope that in the um, position I have of being yeah. able to raise my voice and be a voice for others, as I was as a um, special representative on uh, Women, Peace, Security, uh, uh, the Security Council of the uh, United Nations, number 1325, in 2010, I had the opportunity to speak for the General Assembly in New York. And I have been trying to do that ever since mm -hmm. to make sure that also the voice of these women is being heard. Yeah. What would you say, Michela, about the situation in North Macedonia? Yeah, I have moved from Macedonia like eight years ago. Yeah. So I don't really know the situation exactly now. Mm -hmm. But when I was living there, I could see a clear difference between what I'm seeing now in Holland and what how it was in Macedonia. I also realized that um, Holland is more individual and Macedonia is more collective. Yeah. So Macedo in Macedonia, the people are not really focusing on their self, like let's say a teenage girl or a guy on 20, they really stay with their families. They okay. live with their families for longer. And like in Holland, most of the times, like, um, uh, like you, you become 18 and then you want to move out yeah. like really fast. So I think that's different. And also, I think that um, more w women work in Holland than in Macedonia, at least back then when I was yeah. living there. But I do feel like now it's changing a lot in yeah. Macedonia. I think the mindset is changing yeah. and it's becoming better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you, Michela and Cecilia, for having this incredible, inspiring conversation with me today. Is there anything else? you would like to add to this conversation? Famous last words. <laughs> well, allow me to, from my side, to thank you both, speci specifically Tina, of course, our moderator today. Thank you very much for rendering us the platform where we can discuss these uh, very uh, important, very profound ideas. Um, from my side, I would like to add, like we will, it's very important to understand our history, but we're going towards our future, right? Yeah. And we're doing this together. We're doing this as a... As a, as a planet together more than ever because we're so interconnected and also the challenges that our world is facing, they have an effect on every, every living being on this world more than it has ever had. Uh, I like to work with the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals they were uh, formulated in uh, in um, 2015. We're going to work with them till 2030. 
Uh, they give uh, elements to work on on every aspect that we've mentioned at this table. May it be um, uh, fostering uh, prosperous societies, uh, communities, uh, peace and security in society, w- uh, equal rights for men and women, importance of education, and specifically also of the life on our planet, may it be in the earth, in the land or in the waters uh, or in the air. And um, so I'm, I'm, I would recommend if anybody who is interested to also work on the basis of these SDGs. And I hope to uh, specifically also be there, of course, when this uh, generation of Michela's um, peers, the ones who are in their early 20s, when they are going to make it in all these interesting positions in the future that I can't even imagine because the innovation that that technology will bring us, and this is her field, it will be flabbergasting. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would want to say to all the women to stand up for your rights and do what's the best for you. And I would want to ask all people from all ages, young and old, men and women, to stand up and to fight against sexual harassment and to fight for uh, equal rights between women and men. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, (laughs) both of you. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so I hope everyone who is watching and listening today will be inspired by our talk and so we we can move together all of us to a a wonderful uh, world of inclusion and equality where we are actually being judged for our talents and qualities or for not having them and uh, instead of being judged for uh, our gender uh, race or social status thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much.